Sweet, and we are live, guys. Welcome here for the live stream at the Sony Open. We're going to be going through any last-second changes to my player pool, the weather for this weekend, and, of course, any of your live questions throughout the process. So kick back, make some lineups. Let's go through this player pool because we're finally back to a full field event. So we'll be touching on everyone for this week. You know, we have a whole 144 golfers out there, but we'll go ahead and touch on some of my favorite plays here for this week. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, bring up the projections. And before we hop into the player pool, just going to do a quick review of the golf course because it is important to remember the key stats we're honing in on. So when we're identifying some of these plays, we know why they're a good fit for this golf course. So first and foremost, this is a short track. You can hear that everywhere for anybody breaking down this event. It is definitely true. It's 7,044 yards. What that means is that everyone is in play. Distance isn't going to be a huge advantage this week. It is certainly not a prerequisite for success. What is a prerequisite for success is first off, great approach play, right? You see that at every single golf course. That is no different here at YLI Country Club. What kind of differentiates this place is that you also have to be a really solid putter. We have some small greens here, greens that while they are resort style greens, still have some slight intricacies to them. They're not the easiest putts to read. And really, the players that are good on Bermuda grass historically put extremely well at this venue. I think the most notable example of that would be a Corey Connors, who is typically a loser on pretty much every surface on tour. But here at Wildlife Country Club and at most Bermuda surfaces does putt above that baseline. But here, gains two strokes per round on these greens. So typically, I wouldn't look too much into that, particularly because we only have a three-year sample size. But um, you see that time and time again with these guys that are very comfortable on the surface and at these Hawaiian golf courses where, you know, there's Bermuda grass and then there's grainy Bermuda grass. When you get on these coastal type of courses, it really tends to get rough. You see more of an impact from that grain. So the guys that understand it um, tend to outshine their opponents. Another thing to take note of here is that we have two extra par fours in play. So par four scoring, a little bit more important. And also some of the shorter approach stats, right? Because this is a shorter golf course, if players choose to use three wood or even driver off the tee, I think it's going to be a lot of three woods this week. That's what we've seen in years past. You're still going to have wedges into most every single hole, especially the par fives. You're still going to have mid irons into them, but every player in the field is going to have no trouble reaching them with probably not anything more than a five iron if you hit a really crappy drive on number 18 you might have a hybrid or something like that into a green but nothing that's going to cause these tour players trouble so what we're looking at is more of those short iron ranges i'd say the 50 to 125 and especially the 150 to 175 range um, are really going to be what we're keying in on and you'll see that over here on our key stats for while i'll go ahead and bring this up here um, this is part of our Patreon projections. I have them ranked here. See, shots gained putting Bermuda is at the top. Shots gained approach second. All the way down to driving accuracy, which can be important here when the wind gets up. But whenever we have conditions that aren't very windy, it's still hard to hit these fairways. It's just that when it gets windy, they're some of the hardest fairways to hit in all of the PGA Tour, um, which further exacerbates the effect of this stat. So for this week, I only have it down there at number five. It's not really anything I'm honing in on. And of course, three putt avoidance as well. Even with some of the small greens here, because of some of the intricacies with the reeds, uh, we do see still your fair amount of three puts. All right, so with that being said, um, let's talk about the weather now. So for tomorrow, you're looking at really benign weather, starting with three to four mile an hour winds right around 6, 7 a.m. over there. In the afternoon, you're looking at around 10 to 12 mile an hour winds, which is nothing, right? We saw worst winds last week at Kapalua. We saw 15 to 20 mile an hour winds almost every single day, and they took that golf course to 34 under par. The key factor here is that the golf course is extremely soft. We do have video from the golf course now where we have seen it's likely that it will be lift clean in place tomorrow. We haven't gotten any confirmation on that. They usually wait until the morning of the event to really announce that type of thing so stay tuned tomorrow but if lift clean in place is going to be in play we're going to see a crazy low score something right around 25 under par perhaps even better than that if somebody gets on a hot streak um, about six years ago justin thomas took this place to 27 under par so it's definitely doable and if anything these players are getting better and better and better so i do expect that record to be broken here at some point Another thing to note here as well is that if they play lift clean in place, the importance of getting the ball in the fairway will be only that much more important. And something that we've noticed over the years is that the more accurate players on tour 
have a lot of success here. And this is something that I'm kind of a pet peeve about because you'll see it across the industry. You know, a lot of people will run correlation models, you know, similar to what I run here on the channel and talk about the importance of a one-on-one -on -one stat, right? Where that kind of considering why that would be important. And with driving distance, you know, the more accurate drivers of the golf ball, we know that they're also some of the shorter hitters on tour. We also know that this is a relatively short golf course. So of course it makes sense that Shorter hitters play well at this golf course, right? They also tend to be better around the green players, better putters in general. You got to make up for those strokes at some point to make it on the PGA Tour. So no duh, they're great at this golf course, right? So you might think that you're looking for accuracy here, but really what we're looking for are the short game players. We have seen putting correlated to success here. It's the most correlated stat over the last five years at YLI. Um, which just further drives home that course. So the number one key stat is shots game putting for that reason. Approach play is always important. That's why driving is a little bit further down the board. All right, let's hop into the player pool. So let me go ahead and zoom this out here so we can kind of fit everything on the screen. Hopefully that's a little bit of a better view. Um, if you guys need me to zoom in, just let me know down in the chat. And of course, if you have any questions, feel free to go ahead and let me know as well. At the top of the board, we have Cam Smith coming off the win. Uh, I'm not overthinking it here. This is the best course fit for him on the PGA Tour. Somebody who's an elite short game player, uh, elite with his wedges, that 50 to 125 yard range, and then 125 to 150 range. He's one of the best players on tour. If we go ahead and take a look at the shots gain metrics here. You'll see exactly what I'm talking about. First and foremost, great birdie or better percentage player as well. So if we're going to see a winning score close to something 25, 28 under par, He's definitely more than capable of getting there. But again, if you take a look at these approach numbers, number 21 in the world, this is not just for this field from approaches from 50 to 125 yards, well above average from the 125 to 150 range. And again, very solid in the 150 to 175. So again, checking pretty much all the boxes that we're looking for. He's a great Bermuda grass putter. You can see that they're gaining nearly a third of a stroke per round for his career. And obviously putted the lights out last week. If you guys were watching that showdown with John Rom, just an absolute stud. I expect him to ride that momentum and be a great play once again. The cherry on top here is he's only expected to be owned in 22% of lineups. And I would have expected that to come in closer to 30, maybe even 35%. I mean, anytime we have one of these slam dunk plays coming off a win, He's not overpriced by any means. I mean, that's a completely fair price on him there at $11,200. Um, even at the $12,000 mark on FanDuel, I'd be willing to stomach that type of price. Uh, I would 100% say you should have him in cash lineups. But if you're playing in large field GPPs like I am this week, he's going to be a core part of my builds as well. Number two is Hideki. If you guys saw the fades and sleepers from today, um, you'll notice that not really massive on Hideki, right? Somebody who's not the greatest putter. He doesn't have that elite short game that we're always looking for. And he's somebody who's not great on Bermuda grass, losing a quarter of a stroke per round on that surface. And at the same time, he wasn't that great last week. He started off with that great first and second round and completely tailed off. He really wasn't able to make anything. Um, he made his fair share of putts on Friday, but aside from that round, didn't really have any of that magic. So I'm going to play him at other golf courses that just suit his game a little bit better and isn't really necessary when we consider some of the other guys that we can pivot to in this range. We have a comment down the chat that I see out of the corner of my eye, so we'll go ahead and cover it here. There he says, what's up? Killed it with Kisner, Jones, Rom, and Cam Smith. That is awesome, dude. I uh, If Matt Jones wouldn't have gone off on Sunday, uh, I would have taken home the 100K. So I have a uh, not-so-good spot for Matt Jones in my heart right now. He's probably my least favorite tour player. Um, yeah, we'll get to Maverick Beal. He's in my player bowl too. Same thing with Tom Hoagie. Uh, both of them really low owned. I would agree with that there and uh, great plays. But uh, yeah, good stuff on that, dude. Uh, let's get it again once again. We'll be covering Showdown here as well. Um, last week was a great week for me Week for me in DFS as well. Webb Simpson is somebody I would use rather than Hideki. So um, rather than taking Hideki, I do have a lot of ownership here with Webb. He's elite course history here. Last three years, fourth, a third, and a fourth place finish. Elite course fit ranking there at number five out of this field. In terms of his recent form, he's actually played well of late, right? It's kind of that sneaky type of form where he hasn't gone out and won. He hasn't really placed in the top five. He's consistently making cuts, posting top 25s. And while that's not what we're looking for in a GPP type of contest, he's almost a free square in cash games, right? If you don't want to spend the whole way up for a Cameron Smith, you want to take a little bit of savings. Webb Simpson, a very consistent, safe golfer to take. So... 
Um, really depends on the contest selection there. Even for large field GPPs, if he gets another third or fourth place finish, that could be more than enough, right? Especially if somebody wins in that seven or eight K range, which could definitely happen this week. It's one of those type of golf tournaments. So like them, regardless of the format, great Bermuda or grass putter. If you take a look at some of the shots gain metrics that really like me, really uh, have me liking him this week. Great in birdie or better percentage, very similar to a Cameron Smith. Great at par four scoring. We already talked about how there's the extra par fours here. A little bit more emphasis on that this week. And from these short distance ranges, 51st in the world, 47th, um, 74th. Again, this isn't for the field with these statistics here. This is in the world. Um, so excellent metrics with the irons right there. Let's go ahead and move down to Sanjay. Sanjay, I will consider adding in my poll. It depends if I have enough exposure for him. Uh, I like the course fit. I like the fact that he gains for his historical career on this type of surface. He also gained it last week on the Bermuda grass greens over there at Kapalua. The only issue is the ownership, right? He's 23 and a half percent owned. Um, I'm going to have to invest at least, and that's at the very least 35% into him. So I don't know if I'm going to have room for that. So we'll see a little bit later on. I haven't ran my crunches yet. Um, I would assume he gets squeezed out of the player pool, but it's not like I hate him this week. I just like some of the guys priced around him a little bit better especially Webb Simpson, who's a little bit safer. And Mark Leishman, who I think has a little bit higher upside. First and foremost, has been on absolute fire over the last few months. In that fall swing, he put up a quite a few nice performances, making pretty much every cut. And of course, last week was spiking with the putter. It was something to see on Friday. The guy was making everything 30, 40 feet. And when he has that magic putter working, he's capable of winning any tournament. Majors, you name it. He's put himself in contention at some of the biggest venues. Augusta National, right, um, was in the second to last group last year. So for me, I like his upside. I don't think he's necessarily the most safe play. Um, again, let's look at the recent form metrics with Mark Leishman here. Is he, in terms of his approach play, has been gaining, which is usually the X factor, right? Um, he's not very consistent with his approach play, to say the very least. Uh, in fact, he's lost strokes on approach four seasons before that's how bad he runs at times um, but of late has been great right and if you take a look at some of the bucket stats here um, especially with the short irons right you can see above tour average with pretty much every single part of his iron game in fact it's actually been pretty good with these long irons as well um, if you take a look at the short game stats um, just consistently good across the board and if you're consistently good with your short game this week um, that's really where you're going to make your hay which is really why I like Mark Leishman here, right? So $10,000 price tag, more than fair, um, will be in my player pool. And that's really why I'm not getting any Sun JM. We know that Mark Leishman has been on fire with the putter of late. He's consistently good on Bermuda grass. You can see he's a positive in that category. And at the same time, he has the approach play that we're looking for at a fraction of the ownership. I'd be surprised if Mark Leishman comes in at 17%. I think more realistically, we're looking at closer to 11 or 12%, something like that. Um, so that's why I like them as much as I do, right? My algorithm has them at 17.1%, but it's far from perfect. You can't perfectly project the ownership of every, of every player in the field. Um, it's usually close, right? Um, there's been weeks, at least the three or last three or four events have been running ownership. The largest have been off, I believe was eight and a half percent. So, um, we are at the least close. Uh, and that was at the hero world challenge where, um, there was huge volatility, right? There was only 20 players in the field. Um, uh, so it was a lot harder to get the ownership on that. Let's talk Kevin Niles, so $9,900. He was one of my sleeper picks. Great course fit here, right? He thrives on some of these short golf courses. Again, he deals with a lack of distance. He is a great putter on Bermuda grass. And overall, I mean, I went through it on my sleeper picks video, so I'm not going to go and dwell on this. He's been great, right? Gaining on approach, gaining putting like you would expect with him. If you look at some of the bucket stats, he's been great from 150 to 175, which we're looking for, and great from 125 to 150 yards as well. So, uh, again, checking all the boxes here. Uh, you can probably see a theme with some of these guys. Again, I'm really hunkering down on this Bermuda grass specialist. Um, not, don't necessarily have to be in form of late. So that's something I want to touch on here as well. If you guys haven't seen some of my content, um, I'm not a huge guy for course history, first and foremost. I think course history is extremely volatile. Um, you'll see guys that will miss the cut three times in a row and event come out and win and break through for the first time. But I'm also not a huge stickler for recent form, especially when we've had two or three months off. Now, if you've been playing for two months into the season or even just a month into the season, recent form definitely becomes part of my process. But as of right now, not a huge priority. So, um, it's not a huge problem with any of these guys, maybe except for Hideki Matsuyama. The rest of them have been in top form. But you'll see with the rest of our picks, and it's going to start right about now, guys. 
there's going to be some guys that were in horrible form at the fall that I'm willing to get to. So when I keep that in mind, um, thank you for letting me know that. Yeah, I have Pell in 100% of my lineups, guys. So I'm going to make a super duper quick adjustment on that. I have my lineups up and ready to change for that. So uh, I can change that while we're talking here. Um, go ahead and put any questions you guys have down in the chat, and I'll answer them while I'm doing this. Um, but yeah, I'm playing two sports right now, doing a uh, live stream. It's a it can be a little bit tough at times, but we got this. Um, something I will note as well for this player um, is I don't think you have to spend all your salary, right? So if you like some of these chalky options, we're going to get into a Corey Connors here in a second. Um, go ahead and just leave $300, $400 on the table. Go ahead and take a Corey Connors who's going to be chalk. And there's quite a lot of chalk in that 9K range. I mean, Taylor Gooch going to be owned an absolute crap ton. So if you want to go ahead and take guys like that, um, that's how I would go ahead and do so. Cool. I just crunched and just took Norvell Pell out. I'm just going to upload that. I'm not going to worry about anything else. Pascal would be the guy that would play for him, right? I'm not going to worry about putting him in, but that would be Pascal right now. All right. We are good to go for now. Cool. Sorry about that, guys. We have uh, $750 worth of NBA lineups in right now, so I don't don't necessarily want to leave 100% Pell in all of those lineups. And then you also said Harden, Art Irving, and yeah, I had them projected in, so we're good there. All right, back to the player pool, guys. All right, let's talk about Corey Connors. Um, first off, Abraham Answer was in shit form last week. People are willing to forgive and forget, it seems. Um, I have him at 15% right now in my algorithm. A lot of people are touting him, right? So you'll see a little bit higher ownership on him, probably closer to 18 or 19%. He's also not a good putter on Bermuda grass. He's a loser over his career. Wasn't in great form after his win at the FedEx St. Jude. Really fell off. Can't blame the guy. He broke through for the first time. I'll, I'll wait to play him at some of these bank grass courses. I just don't think we need to force it right now, especially because Corey Connors is priced right below him and it's probably my favorite play on the slate. It's just a real annoying situation that he's as owned as he is. I mean, look at 24% ownership right there. Corey Connors, this is a perfect course for him. He's probably not going to have to hit driver on any hole. Just, just should just hit his driving iron out there. He can get it out there 280 yards and hit wedge or middle iron into every hole. And there's not a better iron player in the world. So actually, I take that back. I take that back. That's just not true. Morkawa, Hovland, a lot better. JT, a lot better. But in terms of like an 8K or a 9K option, or even a $7,900 option, like he is in most majors, like you're not going to find a better iron player. So really consistent approach play as well. Um, he's off the tee play as well. Very accurate off the tee. So if he wants to go ahead and try and push it out there, he's definitely capable of keeping it in these tight fairways. So Corey Connors, just an immaculate ball striker. You can see right here, course fit ranking number 37. Recent form ranking, which again, we're not putting that much stock into, but it's nice to see that he's top 20 at the very least. And we talked about this a little bit earlier. So if you're just tuning in, I'll go in and remind you, he's a gainer on the surfaces here. At Wailea, for whatever reason, he seems to turn on that putting spark. He's gaining over two strokes per round at YLI, which that is the best of any tournament by far for somebody like a Corey Connors. And again, he's a loser historically. So if he's going to come out and be gaining strokes on the greens, um, he's the best ball striker in this field, at least. Um, that's what I should have said earlier. He's not the best ball striker in the world. Uh, I absolutely love him here. So again, he's not a core play just because of how highly owned he is. But I'm going to have at least 40% exposure to him. So I'm owning him like I am a core play. I want to go ahead and get that out there. It's just extremely annoying that he's as owned as he is. Harris English is a sleeper pick this week. Everyone wants to bash him after last week, right? And I had a ton of them as well. He's one of my core picks, right? He's probably my biggest flop from last week. Didn't end up tanking our main lineup, thank goodness. I ended up taking a little bit more of his stars and scrubs approach last week. Didn't really need him in the high 7K range, but... I'm willing to forgive and forget, especially given that we're at another Bermuda grass course. He's going to be able to go into that short game. He's a very stout around the green player, very stout putter. You can see getting nearly half a stroke per round on Bermuda grass. Uh, I'm willing to at least give him a pass, right? We had five or six weeks off at the very least. He did play that team play event, but aside from that, didn't have action until November. So, and then the Ryder cup before that, for that reason, I'm willing to give him a pass, right? You're going to have some guys that came out a little bit rusty. And if he shakes out that rust, he's underpriced. He should be in the mid 10K range. At the very least, he should also be garnering quite a bit of ownership. So I'm willing to forgive and forget to try and buy in on a little bit early. Whereas an Abraham answer, he doesn't have a historical course fit, right? You know, he had a bad week last week. I'm not willing to forgive that when he's also historically horrible on these type of surfaces. So 
Um, that's my take on there. And uh, you said just load up on Pascal. Um, him and O'Neal might try to go on. Ooh, so you're saying, is he that good of a play? Um, go ahead and let me know on chat if you, if you think I should swap onto him. Uh, but I already had 100% of Kongwu, so I'm not sure if I can really do that. All right, let's keep moving down the board there. Taylor Gooch, a core play for me. If you guys saw the video earlier on this week, uh, great play here. He's also one of the shorter hitters in this field. But in terms of his iron play, absolutely going to be popping off the board. Let's go ahead and check that out. In terms of his iron play in the last 24 measured rounds, gaining over a third of each stroke per round, the putting hasn't been quite as good as it was in years past. Uh, Bermuda grass is his best surface. You can see, you know, right around where he usually does in terms of Bermuda grass. But in the fall, this guy was gaining a stroke per round with this putting. Just that's really what vaulted him into contention week in and week out. And if he can return to that kind of putting, he's going to contend, if not win this event. So we saw him win the RSM Classic. Would not be surprised to see Taylor Gooch win once, even twice more here in 2022. He's on that type of trajectory with his career. You can see with par four scoring, excellent. You know, all across all three categories, excellent metrics right there. And in terms of his approach play, um, great with the scrambling, but really good with the long irons, which isn't that important this week. But uh, again, that's a little bit of a boost to his player profile for sure. Um, anyone that just got here, by the way, you guys can uh, go ahead and put any questions you guys have down in chat. What is going on, lazy mofos? Hopefully you're doing well tonight. And uh, yeah, if you're telling me I, I need to get Pascal, I'm going to go ahead and do that real quick because it's, it's it's easy enough for me to make that change. So go ahead and give me 30 seconds here to change this. We have a uh, quite a bit of an investment in NBA tonight. I'm just going to project them for 25 points and that will get me all the Pascal we need. Seems seems reasonable. Um, another thing to note for tomorrow, guys, is if you're playing showdown, there's not going to be a huge difference between the morning and the afternoon wave. So we're dealing with three to four mile an hour winds in the mornings, 11 to 15 in the afternoon, which there's going to be a difference in the scores, right? But you're probably talking a 0.3 or 0.4 shots gain difference. I wouldn't be changing your entire build just based on a tiny split like that. There's definitely going to be people in the afternoon that go off. Sure, on average, you might have a few guys go a little bit lower in the morning, but still have it balanced, right? I wouldn't be swinging your lineups one way or the other too much there. Um, I, I get asked that question a lot, and uh, it really depends. I mean, if you're getting a huge difference between the morning and the afternoon wave, you know, like no wind in the morning, you know, one to five mile an hour, and then 25 to 30 in the afternoon, then sure, right? There's there's a time and place for everything. Uh, that would be the time and place to make those type of adjustments. But when we're dealing with benign conditions for the entire day in general, um, isn't something that you need to really prioritize. All right, and once again, we are uh, all set with those lineups. Cool. <laughs> oh my gosh, I, I see I see what you're calling in now there. Yeah, I, I'm just putting in Pascal and we're, we're leaving it. Yeah, he's just gonna play Pascal like the whole game. All right, moving on. We have uh, Kevin Kisner here. Um, again, if we're prioritizing short game, particularly on a Bermuda grass type of track, Kevin Kisner is going to jump off the board. The recent metrics don't look great because the last time he played anything with measured rounds, he had the four rounds last week. But before that, it was way back in October. So uh, this recent form isn't really indicative of where his game was at. Last week at Kapalua, looked great with the iron play, was making a ton of putts on these grainy Hawaiian Bermuda grass surfaces. Um, I'm going to be on him once again. Billy Ho, very similar type of course, uh, sorry, course fit right there. Short hitter, great on Bermuda grass, great with his short irons. Um, I talked about him on my sleeper picks video, so I'm not going to go into an insane amount of detail there. Uh, we can't talk about this player pull for all night. We've already been here 25 minutes, but at least wanted to talk about these stud tier options, right? These guys in this high 8K range, 9, 10K range. Um, now we're kind of kind of focus on just the guys that I'm really hammering home on. So you're going to see my player pool. I believe it has 50 players right now um give or take five players either way um i'd say my core players would be my top 15 to 20 guys so that's what we're going to focus on from here on out all right russell henley I talked about him on my core plays video just if you're using any type of stat model this week it's going to give you a ton of russell henley some good reason form great on bermuda grass um the iron play is exactly what we're looking for sure he's highly owned but much like a Corey connors you can't find a Excuse me, guys. You can't find a flaw in his course, but you can't find a flaw in his recent form. Uh, you, there's no reason to fade him. So I will have plenty of Russell Henley this week, uh, even in especially so in some of my cash lineups. I mean, $8,500 for him um, seems like an absolute steal. Matt Jones, a fade. The guy, 
I'll just say if uh, he didn't go off last week, I, I think I already said it here on the slide and I did. Uh, what a one hundred K. So yeah, he's a fade. F Matt Jones. That's all I'm gonna say. Um, Maverick Mealy. Let's go ahead and talk about him now. I love Maverick Mealy's week, so I have him in my player pool. I'm not gonna have forty percent of them by any means. I'll probably have 20 25 percent, something like that. But in terms of his off the tee game, he is long off the tee, but he's also relatively accurate. He's also somebody who can get it out there with those driving irons, those hybrids. I expect him to be laying back quite a bit because he has that extra distance. On Bermuda for his career, hasn't been the best, much better on Bent, much better on POA as well. Um, that's why he's seen perform so well on that West Coast swing, but has shown spike performances in his career on Bermuda. So it's not out of the equation. He has done it before, just a little bit less likely. I mean, if we were on bent grass this week at this short type of track, small greens, the type of course where he just absolutely rips it apart. I mean, I'd have 40, 50% of them, right? I mean, we'd be talking about having all the Maverick McNeely, but this is unfortunately a Bermuda grass type of track, which just hasn't been his best in the past. Still like him as a player this week, don't get me wrong, but uh, I am uh, at least slightly concerned about that. Seamus Power was a great play last week, um, was in my really high dollar lineup last week that had a chance to take down the 100K uh, and just kind of flopped on the weekend, right? Kind of fell a little bit flat. Um, in fact, if he would have shot 69 or lower on the first day, he shot 70. So one shot better. Uh, I would have had an extra eight points because of the under 69 bonus and uh, would have really had a great week. We would have gone from winning about $2,800 to around 10 grand, but uh, it is what it is. Seamus Power, though, great play. Once again, I'll have enough of them. He's $8,100. That is a fair price on him. Um, Cam Davis and Charles Howell III, first and foremost. Charles Howell III, completely overpriced. Uh, I get that he's had elite course history here, but as I mentioned before, course history, not something I hammer home on. It's just hasn't been proven to be historically correlated to success, except at just a handful of golf courses. Sedgefield, because it's such a unique course, Harbor Town, Augusta National, Pebble Beach, those intricate, very complex type golf courses, that's where you see course history actually mattering, especially when you have complex greens. That's another part of the equation there. Um, that's not the case with this golf course. So I get that he's, you know, maybe has a lot of good vibes here and whatnot, but the fact of the matter is he's getting up there in age, hasn't looked very good. You can see his course fit ranking right here. Number 70 in years past, he would have been a top 10 course fit ranking, right? This is a short game guy, a guy who's great with those short irons, those wedges, but he hasn't been that same guy. So that's what I'll say about him. You know, guys decline over time like they do in any sport. And that's what I see with the Charles Howe the third. Damron says, let's go. Yeah, uh, I'll touch on FanDuel at the end, actually. Thank you for reminding me there. Um, you can see I have the FanDuel pricing on here, guys. Um, it's not sorted in the order. I have it sorted by DraftKings um, just because a lot more people play DraftKings. But there's a lot of guys that are you know overpriced on DraftKings, like Zane Hoot down here, over $10,000. And some guys that are completely underpriced, right? Um, one that comes to mind, let's see, it would be like an Adam Long, a little bit underpriced. And then there's some guys that are overpriced, like a Brendan Grace down here at $9,400. So... Almost a completely different breakdown because of those pricing tiers. But yeah, we'll go ahead and cover that at the end. All right, moving on with our player pool. Jason Kokrak, um, there's a lot of rumors going around that he's injured right now. Um, he was talking about withdrawing last week. He finished dead last. Uh, a lot of people are buying back in on him. He's being touted by a lot of people. I mean, if he was going to be super low owned, I mean, I have him at 12% right now, you know, 11 and a half. If he was coming in around 5 6%, I'd be willing to take the risk on him. But that's not necessary at double digit ownership. Moving on a little bit further down the board, Brendan Steele at $7,900. He's a great course fit here just because of how short the track is. He's more of an accuracy guy than anything, but unfortunately, not great on Bermuda grass. So that kind of holds him back from being a core play. If you want to go ahead and mix him into your lineups, wouldn't blame you for doing so. Chris Kirk doesn't have that problem. He's a little bit of a better ball striker in terms of his approach play. A little bit more consistent, but with Chris Kirk, he's also better on Bermuda grass. So that's why I'm siding with him just a little bit more. I mean, similar ownership numbers on both of these guys. And you can see my projected cut right here, closer to 50% than 45. So um, that's why I like him there in that instance. Christian Bezadenhut, if we're taking more of a historical look at his game, see what the course fit ranking right here, um, this is calculated over the last 100 measured rounds. So again, a much wider view than something like the recent former here, which is just the last 24 rounds. Um, he's popping off the board, right? Number six on the board. Um, somebody who's coming in also relatively overlooked, just 10% ownership. And if you guys remember at the Bermuda Championship, Christian Bezainhut was 40% owned. 
That was a short Bermuda grass track because this guy is a Bermuda grass wizard and he had come off two top five finishes in a row on the European tour. His only start since then was at the Bermuda championship and he fell flat on his face. But at the same time, this is a guy who's much better than his price tag right here. Um, if he was priced with the Bermuda championship, not even on the record, he'd be in the nine K range. So if you're getting him at $7,800 near 10% ownership, going to be a great play here. Um, Somebody I considered putting in the core, um, but I like to go into Jewel Damon just a little bit more. And you can probably see why here. Number 17 on the board for course fit ranking, number 10 with recent form. I mean, he's not the best for meter grass player, but if you take a look at the recent shots gain metrics, this is something I pointed out during my core picks video as well. Um, he's been gaining of late on shots game putting a quarter of each stroke per round. And all of these measured rounds are on Bermuda grass. So that's that's an important stat to note there. So of late has been in a groove on these surfaces and perhaps has found something. So that's why I have so much, I, I'd say just, I'm excited for his game this week. I think he's really going to go out there and have a good week. I project them very well. Um, I actually put an outright bet on him to win. He's won at Coastal Tracks before. He also won at... It wasn't Mayakoba. It was Kralis Putakanya Championship. Um, it was a coastal pass polym course, but at the same time, short course, similar looks to what he's going to get over here at Hawaii. Um, Sibu Kim is like the X factor of the week. So Sibu Kim at $7,700 hasn't looked good with his metrics, but anytime he's won, it's been on Bermuda grass. So the fact that he's losing a quarter stroke per round here doesn't really bother me. Uh, he's gained over eight strokes before on Bermuda grass for an event. Uh, which again, so that's such an outlier, right? But it happens, and that's when he wins. Uh, I'm taking him with his pure upside. He's an extremely volatile play. Um, it, more likely to miss the cut than he is to make the cut. You can see that there, 42.7% made cut percentage. Um, but his upside is a win here. And there's not that many people in this range I would give that kind of upside to. Um, maybe five, six at the most in this whole 7K range. Um, you know, at least 70, 80% of them at the most have top five upside. So I um, definitely like him for some of these large field tournaments. Barry says, like Kirk down in the chat. Yeah, me as well, right? You know, he's got that iron play, the wedge play that we're looking for on Bermuda grass. He's been all right. And he's been worse on other surfaces. So yeah, I agree there. Um, whether you're in cash or GPPs, I think Chris Kirk, definitely worth a look. Keith Mitchell, I love Keith Mitchell. The guy's won me so much money. Um, I bet him top five at like, 85 to one at the three M open. And he had that day with like eight straight birdies. Uh, great, good times. He actually almost won that golf tournament. That would have been pretty nuts. Um, Tom Hoagie. I know we had someone mention him in the chat before. I believe it may have actually been you, Barry. Um, great recent form ranking. Number three in the field. Number 24 in terms of course fit. A lot of that's because he's a shorter hitter. Right, He does it with the approach play. He does it with the uh, putting as well. And you can see he's not the best for Peter Grass putter, but we've seen him pop in the past on this surface. So much like a Siwoo Kim for his career is inconsistent on Bermuda, but at the very least has had some spike performances. Um, so not somebody I'm going to put down as a core pick, but in large field tournaments, definitely getting some leverage there at just 8.5% owned. If you guys haven't seen my value picks video, um, I'll go through some of the guys in this range. Um, that's who we're going to hunker on here. I'm going to have a lot more ownership to these value picks than any of the other yeses in this range. So uh, Brendan Todd at 7,500 bucks. Again, much like a Tom Hoagie, shorter hitter, gets it done with the iron play and the putting. But even more so, he gains half a stroke per round on Bermuda grass. And that is a massive sample size for Brendan Todd at this point. Uh, honestly, he's won at some of these other shorter tracks in the past. But if I was going to pick a track that's just built for his game, it's this golf course. Even more so than the tracks that he's won at. So love him this week. Think that he could really turn it around because I uh, haven't really seen that great a form of him of late. You can see... He's not here at number 30 in terms of recent form. He hasn't done anything flashy, though. He's been just kind of middling, um, which I guess is good enough to get you to number 30, right? Uh, majority of people are hit or miss, you know, a little bit inconsistent. If you're looking for a cut maker, so if you're playing cash, I think he's the play this week, right? He's, he's at the very least probably going to go out there and make a cut. Um, you can see I have him at a 50% cut rate, probably actually a little bit higher than that in reality, just, just based on the course fit alone. Let's go down to a Denny McCarthy now. So Denny McCarthy at $7,400. Recent form has been great, believe it or not. A little bit sneaky. Uh, I don't think if you thought of recent form that Denny McCarthy would be the first guy to come to your mind. But this is just based on shots gained over the last 24 measured rounds. He's number 17 in the field. Um, so underpriced if we take a look at that metric, which again, 
you know, I'm mentioning it because a lot of people out there love looking at recent form. Not a big deal for me this week. What I love about Denny McCarthy's, let's go over here to the metrics, show you what I'm talking about. So he's down here, here at $7,400. He's been okay with the approach play of late. Look at the putting, right? He gets 0.85 strokes per round on Bermuda grass. That's right. That's not a typo right there. 0.85. And that's over a 500 round sample size. Now, Denny McCarthy, he's always the best putter on tour. If you ask any PGA Tour player, and I mean any PGA Tour player, who the best putter on the PGA Tour is, they're, every single one of them is going to say Denny McCarthy. If you put him on Bermuda grass, and for those that are a little bit more stat inclined on the PGA Tour, they'll especially say Denny McCarthy. There's just no debate there. So like him there at $7,400. He was in our value picks video. You can also see he's coming in relatively high owned. So if anybody in this range, he's definitely garnering his fair share of ownership. But at the same time, much like a Corey Connors, much like a Taylor Gooch up top, I'm not actively trying to avoid those type of people. If they're great plays. If they're, you know, slam dunks at their type of price tags, differentiate elsewhere, right? There's plenty of guys in my player pool that are coming in with sub 5% ownership, particularly in the 6K range, which we'll get to here in a second, or in the single digit ownership up here, right? That's a relatively low ownership number for somebody in the 7K range. So just, you know, differentiate when you need to. Let's move down a little bit further. Adam Long has started to look like he's grounding back into form. If he's back to where he was in the early 2021 part of the season, um, would be underpriced at $7,300. So I, I at least have him in a few lineups. Pan Kazire has won at this event before. So you'd think he'd be higher owned than just 5.6%. But somebody I thought I'd have to fade. I thought he'd be right around 20% owned. But if he's going to be owned just in the single digit range, I'll definitely have my shares. He's a great Bermuda grass putter. He gains half a stroke per round on the surface and, again, has won at this event. He's relatively horrible off the tee player, but you can get away with that here. Um, Brian Stewart, Lucas Herbert. Um, Stewart's a good course fit, but he's too highly owned, in my opinion. Uh, he's also a little bit too highly priced. He should be in that mid-6K range. Lucas Herbert, he was a better course fit last week. Uh, I think he's going to get into a little bit of trouble off the tee. Same thing with Stewart Sink. He's very inaccurate off the tee. The only county argument I'm willing to hear on Stuart Sink is that he won at Harbor Town and he's won at the RBC Heritage, which you wouldn't expect to, him to have won at. He's won at them in the past as well. So he's had success at these short Bermuda grass tracks, which in reality you wouldn't expect him to, right? Only gaining 0.02 shots game per round on Bermuda. Uh, again, he's a very inaccurate driver. So here it's it's just a very polarizing situation. I mean, I'm fading. I'm not going to have him in my player pool. But I would understand if you played him. That's that's kind of what I'm trying to say there. Taylor Pendrith, I want to touch on. He's going to be like the highest, the second highest upside play on this slate, I say. Uh, remember him at the Bermuda Championship? You know, he was a quote unquote horrible course fit, right? I, I fell victim to that narrative. He's more of a ball striker by nature, kind of like a Corey Connors. Um, hell, everyone that went to that Kent State um, golf team, that is a Mackenzie Hughes, Corey Connors, Taylor Pendrith. They're all, first of all, all stud golfers, but all of them are also really good on Bermuda grass because that's what you have up there in Ohio. You can see all of them gain on Bermuda grass. And Corey Connors, again, he's great on these coastal Bermuda grass surfaces. So uh, I think there's something to be said for that because all of them have just such drastic numbers on the surface. And now that's the case with Pendrith, right? He doesn't have the most, he doesn't have the largest sample size, uh, not like somebody like a Denny McCarthy, but you're still talking 50 plus rounds and he's gained almost half a stroke per round on these surfaces. If he's going to go out there and ball strike the shit out of it and he's going to gain half a stroke per round putting, that is in a gold mine. I mean, he could win this golf tournament, right? Um, there's only a handful of people in this range, like I said before, that can win this golf tournament. And Taylor Pendrith might have the most win equity of all of them. You know, one or two, there might be one guy with more. So uh, I absolutely love him this week, especially for GBP type of builds. Now, if you're going in cash, you're trying to find a safe pick, he's not going to be your guy. He's definitely a little bit wild off the tee at times, but if he can keep the ball in play, perhaps if he just clubs down off the tee, which I would advise all these players to be doing, uh, he would be in a very good position this week. So what else we can touch on here? Adam Shank. Um, I'll, I'll just go ahead and say I do like Chad Ramey. I do like Zach Johnson this week. Um, Ramey was a stud corn fairy tour player. Zach Johnson, uh, we know his game, right? Short guy, good with his wedges, great putter on Bermuda. Um, obviously going to be a good course fit here. Um, Adam Shank, though, was a core pick for me just because he's underrated, right? He's down here at $7,000. This guy should be near $8,000. He was towards the end of 2021. You know, DraftKings finally figured out 
hey, Adam Shanks, not that bad of a golfer. This guy actually knows what he's doing. Um, so they started pricing him up right towards $8,000. And he actually started garnering quite a bit of ownership at those rates as well. So people kind of figured him out. But now he's $7,000. You know, he had those the month or two off. So maybe he reset in form. Oh boy, I hope not because he was on such a hot stretch there. Um, he's still single digit owned. So I absolutely love the play here. It seems like people haven't really caught on um, to the play this week. And if he comes out there, posts another top 25, that kind of thing, I guarantee you next week he's going to be chalk. Yeah, especially if he's not priced up. So um, keep that in mind. I'm trying to buy in early on an Adam Shank um, because he really started to show something towards the end of last year. Uh, we have Rishon Hoat upgraded from out to doubtful. Okay, that doesn't change shit, bro. <laughs> yeah, you had me in the first half, man. <laughs> I was like, wait. I was like, wait, no. Because I have so much more of Bagley. Uh, you, ha you had me in the first half there. Uh, Alex Smalley is like the meme play this week. Uh, the guy is so volatile. He'll go out there, have a great week. The next week he'll absolutely suck. Uh, I'm playing him just because a lot of, there's a sh couple of sharp people that I follow on Twitter um, that bet him outright this week. And they seem to be like the Alex Smalley whispers. You know, he's he's so volatile. He'll go out there, post a top 25, and then miss the cut the next week. Then post a top 25, then miss the cut. They always seem to get him on when he gets that top 25. And they're on him this week. So, Alex Smalley going to be the play there. Uh, in terms of his game, he's a shorter hitter. He's a good approach player. He's decent putting, right? He needs a quarter of his stroke per round on Bermuda grass. Uh, I think he can make a lot worse plays. So he'll be in my GPP pool. Uh, wouldn't be a core pick. Wouldn't be a cash play, though, by any means. Um, Harry Higgs, also extremely underpriced. Again, towards the end of 2021, um, didn't play his best golf, right? He started, he started to fall off, started to miss some cuts. But towards October, November, September, that part of the schedule there, Harry Higgs was super hot, right? He started becoming chalk. He was like 20, 25% owned every week. He went on a 10-cut streak. But now no one wants to play him just because he had a few bad tournaments there at the end, right? I'm not going to you know, hold it against him. Those were tougher fields to begin with. You can see Fandle, they're spot on, right? So $8,400. They know where to price him. And whereas over here on this site, just completely underpriced. So... Um, Harry Higgs, going to be a great play. Great on Bermuda grass. Uh, I'm going to go, yeah, show, go and show you some of the metrics. And keep in mind, this is while he's been playing some bad golf, right? So a lot of these metrics are skewed towards the under. But if you take a look, still gaining with the putter, you know, right around his average there on Bermuda grass, still gaining around the green. In fact, gaining off the tee, which we're not used to seeing from him. You can see that it's kind of a combination of the driving distance um, and the accuracy, but for Harry Higgs to be gaining off the tee, that's not something that we see very often. Last year, lost strokes off the tee. So if he's gaining off the tee, if you can turn around the iron play, which completely disappeared, again, he's had plenty of time to work on his game. I expect him to come out very sharp um, and rely on that putting that is always there. That is the one constant for Harry Higgs. Going to be one of the best putters on the PGA Tour. Um, Going to have a good week. So I think he's completely mispriced. Um, something I'll mention as well is on my core picks video, guys, I had Pat Perez as a play. He is out. He has been marked as out. He's withdrawn. It is not on DraftKings yet. They haven't put the little red tag on him or on FanDuel. So I do expect him to be owned tomorrow, unfortunately. So um, RIP everyone out there that has Pat Perez lineups. Same thing with Scott Piercy. He has been marked out on DraftKings, but on FanDuel, he was not marked out. Um, they may have changed that um, since I checked earlier on today, but um, something to definitely note there. Don't trust your sources from DraftKings or FanDuel. Um, they don't really know what they're talking about. Or at least they, they don't stay on top of it, right? All right, Hank Libiota, it's $6,800. Um, we're going to go through this 6K range rather quickly. Um, there's not that many guys I'm playing. There's probably 10, 12 players total I have marked as a yes in this range. And I'm really trying to pick my spots this week. Sure, there's a lot of guys you could take chances on down low. Um, but I'm trying to make sure that they have legit top 10 upside. And Hank Leibiona most certainly has that. He's not one of the longer hitters. But he's great with his irons. And he had a great season last year on Bermuda. So you can see for his career, not the best Bermuda grass putter. But for 2021, he gained over a quarter of a stroke per round on Bermuda. So that's more than a half stroke split from where his career stats are to what we saw last year. He had some tournaments where he gained nearly eight strokes putting per tournament which is some of the best stuff we've seen all year. Um, he posted a few top five finishes, contended in numerous tournaments. In fact, was the favorite to win on a Sunday after nine holes and completely imploded on that last nine, but just shows you the kind of upside that he has. So $6,800, far too cheap. You can see 
great course fit ranking, great recent form ranking. Um, and again, the shots game putting on Bermuda isn't ideal for his career, but we've seen much better play of late. Um, you see Scott Pierce at the WD there. Let's move on to Grayson Sig. And I have a really weird feeling that this is this is gonna be the coming out party, right? So first and foremost, we had the Georgia Bulldogs win this week, which cost me a ton of money. I bet uh, a grand on Alabama. That aside, Georgia Bulldogs came through for their first win, you know, coming out party, everything like that. It's time for Grayson Sig's coming out party. He went to UGA. He was a standout at that program. And pretty much everyone that's a standout at UGA that ends up being the number one player at UGA, especially somebody like Sig, who played in almost every event. And what you have to realize for Georgia is you have to finish in the top 10 of the event period, not just the top 10 of your team every week, to play for Georgia. And he played almost every single golf tournament. So in the highest stakes and the hardest fields in golf, which college golf is extremely competitive these days, he was an absolute stud. He's also somebody who's from Augusta, Georgia. He's from the Southeast. He plays on Bermuda grass all the time. So I've heard people in the industry talk about, oh, he loses nearly a stroke per round Bermuda grass. He has 24 measured rounds in the database. That could be just variance, right? That's just bullshit, right? If he's from the Southeast, I, I and he's been a good putter. He's a short game type of guy. He's not a long player off the tee. He's decent with his approach play. He's one of these short type guys that makes a ton of putts, and he's going to start to do it here at some point. Um, before he was even on tour with a tour card when he earned it last year on the Corn Ferry Tour, he was getting sponsorship exemptions because his talent's obvious. He's Again, he was a standout at Georgia, and standouts at Georgia, just to give you guys an idea, Harris English that's playing in this field, Kevin Kisner that's playing in this field, just prolific tour winners. Um, they said that of the players from Georgia in this field, there's 37 wins between them. Um, that's the kind of guys that come out of that program. So uh, Grayson Sig, he's more expensive than he should be for sure. Um, but he's also being completely overlooked. He's just, he's, when he turns it around, he, he's going to win a golf tournament. Like he's, he's that good. He's, he's, a, he's a gamer, right? That's what they say about those guys coming out of Georgia as they come out mentally strong and, and ready to win golf tournaments. Um, I am extremely high on him going, uh, going forward. And uh, even this week, um, Hayne Buckley as well. So Hayne Buckley was kind of like the hot topic of the fall um, the first Corn Ferry Tour guy to come out and just really assert himself is good on approach, good on off the tee, great on Bermuda grass as well. So I'm willing to go there. He should be in the mid 7K range at the very least. He's very much so underpriced. I think this this projected ownership is wildly off. I think he's going to be at least 10% owned. So stay advised about that. You're definitely going to have to give at least a little bit of exposure there to get leverage. Um, but love um, Hayden Buckley this week. Kramer Hickok would rather play him on bent grass. Cal Stanley is a dog shit putter. We don't want dog shit putters this week. Tyler Duncan, same thing on Bermuda grass. Um, we don't want dog shit putters. Um, Graham McDowell gaining over a third of a stroke per round on Bermuda. Interesting, right? He's, he's lost some of that distance off the tee. Um, somebody who is known for his wedges, some of those 150 to 175 yard shots. So why not him this week, right? He's got the putting we're looking for. He's got that iron play. Um, and he looked better than he has in the past at the Bermuda Championship. He had that really good round one. Um, I had high hopes for him there. He was in my favorite lineup, on my high-dollar lineup that week. He ended up making the cut at the very least. But, uh, yeah, I like him here as well. So you can see his projected cut rate is a little bit lower. His projection's pretty low here. That's just based on – because my projections are based on the numbers, right? I don't go through and manually change anything here. I let the numbers do the talking. Um, if I need to make adjustments to my player pool itself – I'll go ahead and do so, right? But I'm not going to touch my projections. Um, that's just because the metrics last year were dog crap. But towards the end of the year, we had at least a little bit of encouragement there. And uh, historically, we know this is his type of golf course. He wins at these type of golf courses, or at least when he was a type of player that could win golf tournaments. But the beauty for DFS, we don't need him to win, right? If he goes out there, top 10s, that'll be more than enough. We have a couple comments we'll get to. And I'll remind you guys, um, in about 12 minutes, we're going to wrap this up. So we still have some guys in the 6K range to go through. But feel free to throw any questions down in the chat or anyone you do want me to do a little bit of a deeper dive on. We have the shots gain metrics up here. That's why I have them up here for the stream. So more than willing to go ahead and do that for you guys. They can be for outrights as well, not just for DFS. Uh, Devin Scott says, I love your call on SIG, especially with the UGA background. Um, yeah, exactly. He's going to be like sub 1.5% owned. So you're probably looking at, if you put them in three or four lineups and you're playing a set of 150, that's leverage right there. I'm going to have them closer to 15% exposure. Uh, I'm taking the, the deep dive on a Grayson Sig this week. Um, but again, to get leverage, that would be trivial at the very least. If you're playing a set of 20 lineups, put them in one lineup. That would be enough to do it. Um, Barry says, while JT Poston was looking at him also, yeah, terrible last year, but uh, 
you know, he had the month and a half off. He's had time to kind of hit that reset button. If JT Poston, who's been historically great on Bermuda grass, can turn it around, I, I, I could like it, right? He's great at these short type of golf courses. He won at the Wyndham Championship, Sedgefield. That's one of my comp courses this week. So, yeah, yeah, we'll get to JT Poston. Uh, I also have a acquaintance of mine that's a really good – he literally texts JT Poston like every day. So um, I'm always able to get the recent scoop. And uh, from what I've heard, he's been grinding, just like – grinding 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 so that's always good to know and uh devin says maybe he'll putt well because of the dogs winning the national title that's what i'm saying yeah it's it's dogs week right you know he had a uga breakthrough for the first time in a while uh why not grayson sig his little coming out party for the pga tour uh it would uh it, if he wins you know you know he's gonna go and say that he's gonna be like it was dogs week uh and even though again i lost money that uh, on uh alabama that'd be that'd be great that'd be cinematic uh, again, Pat Perez, guys, or anyone just hopping in there, he withdrew. He's not marked as out on DraftKings. Stay advised with that. He was a cool pick for me. He actually withdrew on Monday. Uh, I had no idea. I don't think anyone out there really had an idea that he withdrew. He was expected to be chalk. Um, FanDuel doesn't have a marked as out. So um, make sure you guys don't get bit by that. All right, let's talk about Peter Malnati. So much like a Grayson Sig, he, he's, he's that you know kind of scary pick to make this week. But uh, Peter Malnati looked great in the fall. He was making cuts left and right. He didn't have a missed cut for those last six events. On Bermuda grass, a prolific putter, getting over half a stroke per round. And he's one of these really large sample size guys where we have over 300 rounds in our database on a Peter Malnati. It is well established that he's one of, if not the best Bermuda grass putter in this field. If Devin McCarthy wasn't here, sorry, not Devin, Denny McCarthy wasn't here, he'd be number one, right? And what to really look at here with Peter Malnati, and I showed this during my value picks video earlier on today, is how he's been getting it done of late, which is actually a little bit surprising. He's been gaining on approach and pretty consistently. That's something that he's typically horrible at. He's usually one of the worst iron players on the tour. But of late, he's been good in those short distance ranges. So you can see top 100 in the world from 50 to 125 top 100 in pretty much every category below 200 yards. You see the longer we get from the hole, the worse it gets. That's not surprising. He's again, one of the shorter hitters on the tour, but he's not going to have to worry about that here at YLI. It's only a 7,000 yard golf course. Really like the putting on Bermuda grass, like the approach play that we've been seeing of late. If you can tap into that approach play, be about a neutral player off the tee, which he's more than capable at this type of track, is at the very least going to go out and make a cut. So in terms of a cash play because of his price, more than viable in that type of format. But again, he's one and a half percent owned. You're looking at a trivial amount of exposure to get any type of significant leverage there. And uh, definitely somebody I'll have my exposure to. We have a comment down here. You have Derek White out for San Antonio Spurs. Vessel, Calum Jordan. In. Yeah, I played a bunch of Lonnie Walker. So that's that. I kind of like anticipated that. Um, do you know if Vassal's starting? If Vassal's starting, if you could let me know, that'd be great. Um, but I definitely think that uh, it, I'll probably stick with Walker. Um, Barry says, I like Mount Nani and Coastal Courses. Yeah, he's had a lot of success at them in the past. He looked really good at the Bermuda, Bermuda Championship as well. So um, definitely agree there. Oh, thank you, Arkansas. Hey, Tal, what's going on, Damron? You're my boy. All right, let's keep, uh, let's keep going down the board here. A couple other flyer plays we can touch on. JT Poston, horrible last year. Guys, look at the ranks here. 119, 119, 119. It's only 144 players in this field. So if I'm going to, we're not even going to look at the shots gain metrics for JT post. And uh, they are uh, about as dog shit as dog shit can be. Let's just say that. So $6,500 um, really, we're just hoping that he returns to some semblance of form of what we saw in the past. What we know about JT post in, you saw him at the Barbasol, by the way, and that wasn't all that long ago. He was in a playoff and lost to Seamus power. So this guy still has that upside. He flashed that in the last three or four months. I think a lot of people forget about that because it was an alternate event, but that was still a relatively stacked field for an alternate event. Um, what we know about him, though, he's a prolific Bermuda grass player. Gains nearly half a stroke per round on Bermuda. He's also really good with the short irons. He's good with the wedges as well, the 50 to 125 yard range. He's horrible off the tee. He's inaccurate. He's also, he's actually relatively long, but he's just extremely inaccurate. At this type of golf course, he doesn't have to hit driver. Now, I haven't been able to, to scoop on it yet. I probably I need to hit up my buddy and ask him about it. I have a feeling he's going to do a lot of laying up because he can get that three wood or even that driving iron out there, probably 280, 290 yards, and that's going to be more than enough. I know if I was his analytics coach or whatnot, I'd be pushing that really hard with a JT post. And so 
Um, we'll have to we'll have to see how if he employs that type of strategy this week, but I would highly recommend him doing so. Here says, curious your take on armor could be sneaky. Yeah, let's go ahead and uh let's check out Ryan Armor. So I'm not sure if I actually have him on here. I thought I did. What's his price? He might be the one. I know I'm one guy short on this list because uh, I had two withdrawals and I have 145 players on here, so I should have 146. He actually might be the guy I don't have on here. Either way, though, Ryan Armour, he's a good course fit, right? He's also one of those shorter hitters. He's good on Bermuda grass. He gains on Bermuda for his career. I can remember that off the top of my head. We also know that he's relatively accurate off the tee. So if we see lift clean in place, which is certainly possible tomorrow morning, he's even more of an attractive play. So $6,300. Let me see if I have him in here. I probably don't. No, I don't. Okay. Um, so I don't have him on here. Uh, either way, though, I would have him in my player pool. He's a decent course fit there. Um, when I go to my optimizer later on, I'll have to make sure I remember to add him there. That'll be important. But uh, yeah, you're absolutely right there. Sneaky good course fit for sure. Uh, good price tag as well. You know, anytime you get an alternate added to the field, you're going to get a good price tag on them. That's just inherent with that. Uh, they usually, you know, you can see there's some guys down here. I'll show you guys at the bottom of the board. They were added to the field like a, Vaughn Taylor, he probably would have been closer to $6,500. Kim Percy probably would have been closer towards the high end of the 6K range. Um, Camilo Vegas mid 6K range. And Bo Hogue probably would have been near $7,000. And now he's only $6,300, which certainly puts him in my player pool. But a lot of these other guys here as well, I'd be willing to play as flyers. They're just good price tags. Not necessarily people that are sexy picks by any means, but uh, there's a lot of inherent value with going to some of those guys that are late ads to the field. Let's go ahead and talk about uh, my third spicy value pick of the week. It is going to be Bo Hostler at $6,200. Um, also somebody who didn't have the best end of 2021, but if we're looking at long-term pedigree, is clearly underpriced at $6,200. It is a great putter on Bermuda grass. The thing is, that's not even his best surface. He's better on bent POA, um, that hybrid type of surface, um, which is just wild. He's just that good of a putter. Um, what do we know about Bo Hostler? So much like a few other guys on this list that might need to kind of tone it down off the tee, much like a JT Poston. Um, Bo Haas are really long off the tee, so he's going to have no problem reaching every green here in two for the par fives. Also likely to probably get it close to some of these par fours in one. You have a couple 350-yard par fours. If you guys saw my course breakdown, you guys know what I'm talking about. Uh, but he's one of the few players who gets it out there at least 320 yards. They might be able to take a peek at those holes. So he has a little bit of hidden upside there. He's obviously a great putter. You've even seen that of late. Great around the green player as well. He's at least been doing that of late. It just comes down to the approach play. You can turn that around. I do see a lot of upside in him. Um, we just haven't seen that much of late. And again, the beauty of this golf tournament, um, we haven't seen these guys in two, three months, some of them, especially somebody like a Bohasser that didn't make the playoffs. Um, so at 6,200 bucks, could make a lot of sense here. Uh, I'm taking a flyer pick on him, and I'm going to have him about 15, 20% of my lineups this week. Uh, I feel pretty good about that pick there. Um, at the very least, making the cut. I think he has a much higher chance than this 33% right here. That's the algorithmic approach to figuring out his rate right there. But uh, in reality, just keeping in mind the course we were there, probably even closer to 50%. So relatively safe pick. Somebody I'll definitely be dishing out there. Roger Sloan and Ryan Moore, very similar picks here. So I want to go ahead and uh, jumble them together. First and foremost, decent putters on Bermuda. I'm not going to say great because he's only gaining 0.12 strokes per round. Ryan Moore, that is. But both of them, great, but they're short irons, great iron players, both relatively short off the tee, but also accurate. So I wouldn't say that they're bad off the tee players for their careers. Go ahead and this isn't for their careers. This is over the last 24 rounds, but for their careers as well, right around average players off the tee. Um, you can see of late, um, both slightly gaining. I believe Roger Stone, a slight loser for his career, but it's within 0.05 strokes of neutral. Ryan Moore, same type of story, right? You're going to get done with the approach play. And we've seen Ryan Moore do that. Um, haven't necessarily seen Roger Sloan do it. But at the same time, both good putters on Bermuda grass. Um, both are a few shots, right? They're only 6,500 bucks. This isn't like we're talking about them as a core play. Um, but at the same time, people will be mixing into the pool. Jim Herman, if you want to play a guy for shits and gigs, go ahead and put him out there. He's going to win a golf tournament about once every three years. So... Uh, if you end up getting them right, the slot machine right, I mean, the one out of 160 golf tournaments that happen that one hundred that uh, three-year span, go ahead and play Jim Herman, right? So there's actually a theory out there, and I, I've seen people that have done this. 
that if you bet a dollar on Jim Herman for every golf tournament, as long as he's 301 and higher, like for his career, you would have made like a shit ton of money. So just, just keep that in mind. He's capable of winning golf tournaments, but uh, yeah, he's, he's a horrible play. I'm not going to have him in my player pool, but if you want to go ahead and take that risk, by all means, go ahead and do so. Mark Hubbard, if we're taking a look at the statistics, is a great play this week. We're talking top 20 recent form, 13 in terms of course fit, um, relatively short player off the tee, but is capable of hitting those irons very well. The putter isn't historically the best. Um, he's a loser on most surfaces, right around neutral on Bermuda grass. So it's at least positive to see that he's better on Bermuda than the other surfaces. Um, so if he can flip that putter, could be a great play this week. Um, but much like everybody else in this range, they're all going to at least have one deficiency, and uh, that is for sure his. Let's see. Two last guys to touch on, and uh, then we'll take any final questions or guys that you guys want me to take a little bit of a deeper dive into, and then we will uh, hop on out of here. So Chesson Hadley here at $6,100. He's a good course fit because he's short off the tee. He's great on Bermuda grass. Good with the irons from time to time. That's what we're looking for with a Chess and Hadley. We know he's going to be accurate off the tee. He's really short. He tends to club down quite a bit as well. He's usually very volatile with the irons. I mean, he's no stranger to going out, losing three or four strokes on approach in just even two rounds. Um, but he's also no stranger of gaining seven or eight strokes on approach. We've seen that before. He's put himself in contention. Should have won at the Palmetto Championship. Um, and yeah, you said uh, Jim Herman is Martin Laird. Yeah, exactly. So crazy enough, I got the Marin Laird week right. Uh, and I also I also got the Jim Herman week right at the Wyndham Championship. So I have I have a, a track record for uh for finding these guys. <laughs> uh, but yeah, he's I'm not doubting that at all. And uh Luke Donald, this is the last guy we'll touch on here. Another Luke, right? Um sixty one hundred dollars has been decent recently. You can see the recent form number eighty four, which for Luke Donald at his age, it's fantastic. Much better than what he's been playing, um, at least towards the beginning of 2021. Um, the course fit is great, too. He's had the iron play. That has not gone away, particularly that wedge play. Luke Donald has been an elite off um, approach player. The thing is with Luke Donald, it's the off the tee, right? He's super short. Um, he wasn't the longest player in the world anyways when he was number one in the world. Um, but now at this point, he's especially short. So um, you really got to try and take him at these short type of golf courses. Um, so it's definitely somebody I'm trying to roster. Um, Dennis Scott says, thank you for the info, man. And thank you for stopping by and enjoying the content. Um, your support here, you guys enjoying stopping by um, is awesome. So looking forward to making even more content. Um, so yeah. Let's see. Anyone else we really need to touch on here? Dolly Van Rudolph. He's a good course fit, but uh, hasn't looked good at all since earning his tour card. Paul Barjon shouldn't be $6,000, but we know nothing about his game. He's a Corn Ferry Tour guy. He's one of the better players on that tour. So that's why I say he's underpriced. He should probably be closer to $6,500, uh, but not anybody I'm actively looking to get into lineups. I also um, I was promised uh, a cake on Cameron Percy. So Papa Strauss let me know down in the Discord that he wanted some information on that. So going to go ahead and give you guys the word with him. First and foremost, somebody he's good with is approach play, right? So he's only $6,100, definitely underpriced. Before his Bermuda grass for his career, a significant loser. So that's the main reason I don't love him. I know he made the cut last year. That's something that um, Papa Strauss had said down in the chat. But at the same time, it's just, you know, it's short sample size, right? You know, if he had made the cut here for five, six years in a row, something like that, um, then I'd be willing to look a little bit more into it. But uh, as is, just a few other guys I'm willing to prioritize, right? You know, Boho gets $6,300. Um, drastically underpriced. So see myself going there a little bit more often. Um, we have a question down in the chat. We have from Barry saying, any good round one showdown picks? So I wouldn't be favoring the morning or the afternoon. I know I already mentioned that, but I expect to see a relatively similar split from morning to the afternoon. But uh, you're looking for some of these like first round leader type of guys. So let's, uh, let's go through the player pool because I haven't really given this that much thought yet. And uh, kind of think about who we would want to take, right? So we're looking for volatile golfers. Corey Connors is no stranger to going out, grabbing that first round lead. So at ninety six hundred dollars, uh, I'm not sure what he is for a first round leader. I'm assuming it's a little bit better than what his four round winning odds are, um, which just shows you how much confidence they have in him coming out and having a good first round. Um, at showdown, probably worth a few looks. Let's see. Maverick McNeely has also gone out to some really good starts on tour. Um, probably worth taking a few good look at. Uh, 
looks at showdown. And again, I don't know the pricing rate, so I'm assuming it's relatively similar to the four round stuff. Rondo is out for Cleveland. Oof. Okay. All right, we'll be out of here soon, so I'll be able to adjust for that. But thanks for letting me know, man. That's a uh, you've been clutch letting me know that down in the chat because I, I got all these lineups live right now. Uh, a few other guys for first round leader though. Let's go through the list for first round showdown. Hmm. Denny McCarthy, highly volatile player. If he has the approach play working, could post a low one. Same thing with Keegan Bradley, also a really highly volatile golfer. I like. Harry Higgs, same story. Let's go towards the top of the board. Let's give you some more core plays. Russell Henley, great option. I'm assuming he's also underpriced for showdown. I guess Webb Simpson or Cam Smith as well. Um, obviously taking one of those two up top would make a whole lot of sense. You probably already knew that though. So um, yeah, that's what I would do there. And uh, we have another question here. Who's the most underpriced and overpriced on FanDuel? So great question. Let's go ahead and hop into it. So for overpriced and the way, I think the best way to identify this is to kind of look at the differences between the DraftKings and the FanDuel stuff. So in terms of overpriced and we don't have to worry, don't have to worry about it anymore was uh, Pat Perez down here, $8,600. He was way overpriced, but he withdrew, so we don't have to worry about that. In terms of someone else who's a little bit overpriced. Hmm. Brian Harmon kind of jumps off the board. He's nearly $10,000. It seems like a little bit of a steep price. I don't hate him here. You can see I have him in my DraftKings poll, but he's only $7,500. Christian Bazain, who definitely getting the respect he deserves on FanDuel. I wouldn't necessarily say he's overpriced, but he's fairly priced, right? He's underpriced on DraftKings at just $7,800. Um, that's what I would say there. In terms of the guys that are underpriced, some of the guys I think you're getting a really good deal on. Let's see. Pendrith stands out, $8,500. I think that's more than a fair price tag. Adam Shank, more than a fair enough price tag. I don't know. Towards the bottom range, at least with some of the guys that would be underpriced, I think FanDuel does a pretty good job with their pricing, but you also have more salary, right? You can pretty much play whoever you want on FanDuel. That's the one thing I'll say um, is if you have three or four core picks, you can almost play them no matter what. You can take two of the guys right down there towards $7,000 and pretty much make any build work. That's kind of the beauty of FanDuel is you're not as constricted with price, but you also get really clustered ownership. So it's a little bit of a trade-off there. Um, but yeah, that's what I would say is overpriced and underpriced. Uh, let's go ahead and see if there's anyone else that really jumps off the board. I mean, Jim Herman's underpriced. He's only $7,100, $100 over the minimum. There's a few other guys at the dead men um, that are obviously a little bit underpriced as well. You know, David Skin's down here. You go to... Wesley Bryan's only seventy two hundred dollars. I also think he's a really good value play. Luke Donald's only seven grand. He's the dead min, which he's almost a dead min on DraftKings too. But I'd say he's underpriced on DK as well. So I also think that he'd be underpriced. Um, yeah, hopefully that gives you an idea there. In terms of some of the studs, I don't think you have to take a Cam Smith, right? So he's twelve grand, or he's slightly prohibitive. You can't take Cam Smith, Hideki, and Webb, right? So you can't get that crazy about it, right? But if you started your lineup with somebody. Um, maybe in this 11K range rather than this 12K range, you think you'd have a lot more of a balanced build. So if you start Corey Connors, Kevin Na, Mark Leishman, you can still make that work. So on FanDuel, um, I would be trying to take more of a studs and duds type of approach um, just because the pricing over there is a little bit more conducive towards that. So hopefully that answers your question there, guys. And unless we have any more questions down in the chat, we're going to go ahead and hop out of here. Um, if you guys are watching this on replay, you have any questions, because lock's not until noon tomorrow Eastern time, um, I'll go ahead and get back to you, whether it's tonight, tomorrow morning. Feel free to put any questions down in the chat. You are going to have showdown live streams this week, so that's going to be in the morning. So starting on Friday morning, we're going to have a showdown live stream at approximately, I'd say, 9 a.m., covering the slate for that day. We'll do the same thing on Saturday and Sunday. We'll have content coming for next week as well, so full slate of content. And I look forward to all that. Again, appreciate all of you guys stopping by. Good luck to all of you with your lineups. Good luck as well, Barry. Um, appreciate you stopping by, Devin. And let's get this cash this week.